working as well. I worked with two screens uh, here at my home office setup. Um, and I'm probably gonna talk for about a half hour or so and then leave plenty of time for questions and, and, uh, and answers. So um, there we are. The, um, what I'm gonna talk about today um, are things that I actually teach at, at Yale on how the federal, state and local level might all try to work together to confront the climate crisis. Um, but a little bit uh, more on who I am and what perspective you're going to hear uh, today. Um, so I'm a former state commissioner. So I was the commissioner of energy and environmental protection in Connecticut for uh, five years. Um, I'm a fan of the executive branch, the implementation branch or the get stuff done branch of government. Um, I'm current lecturer at the Yale School of the Environment and Yale Law School and Yale College. I am a former scientist. I have a PhD. I do like experiments. I'm also a lawyer. I like law and policy. And I'm a dad. I have uh, two wonderful boys. I hope they're not embarrassed by me. My oldest son is now in high school, so he's getting to that age where I do occasionally embarrass them. Um, and I also don't want to disappoint them. So over the next um, half hour or so, I'm going to talk about um, the case for action, why we do need to act on the climate crisis, and talk a bit about the local climate impacts, the things that we're all probably seeing and experiencing here in Connecticut. Um, then I'm going to make a case for why state and local climate policy is where some of the most innovation action uh, and activity is happening. And then I want to end with that uh, conversation about the things we can all do together to actually make progress. So you probably wouldn't have come to this uh, special session tonight if you didn't yeah, with, I don't think I need to convince you that the climate crisis is serious, um, but what we've seen uh, lately, particularly this one's the August 2021 uh, update of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, their latest updates on the science of climate change that paints a pretty stark picture. Um, the words there, the scientists are normally pretty reserved in the words that they choose, and this one in particular, it's a thousand scientists all agreeing by consensus about what words. The words are now that human activity has put a gargantuan output of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, and that's the cause of our uh, changing climate. And that's what's new in this new scientific update is so much more uh, ability now to attribute the changes we're seeing at the global and regional level to human activities. Now, this builds on a report from 2018 that got a lot of coverage in the news, the one and a half degree report, which basically said that we have to really reduce our greenhouse gases from our entire society and economy by between 40 to 60% globally in the next 10 years, if we hope to keep the warming we're gonna to experience to a manageable one and a half degrees. Now, it was often reported around that time that the world was gonna end in 10 years, which is not the case, but the decisions that we're making now are, are important and urgent and are gonna be critical for how hard it is going to be to adapt to the warming we are gonna see in the future. The last sort of big report, and this one's a 1500 page report, the US have been, has been doing this as well. So at the global level, the scientists have a consensus. The same consensus is happening at the uh, national level where 13 federal agencies have described in this national climate assessment, all the upheaval that we're already experiencing across the country. And I'm gonna take a closer look at some of this um, in the next couple of slides over the next uh, few minutes. Um, to begin, what are all those greenhouse gases doing? Well, they're warming the planet and warming it fairly dramatically. You've already, already probably heard this, that the seven hottest years on record have been the last seven years. And 2020 basically tied 2016 for being the hottest. 2021, I think, was like the third hottest or so on record. And according to the latest science from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the warming that we are observing, so this is not model, this is what we're actually observing, this very sharp end of the hockey stick, so to speak, is unprecedented in the last 2000 years. And we are, it is being driven, this is the second graph here, by human uh, activities. The natural systems, the natural fluctuation and the solar cycle and volcanic activity could not, produce the amount of warming that we are actually observing. So again, the science is getting more and more definitive uh, uh, on that point. 
but that's the global level. Let's bring it to the US level. This data is probably now a little outdated. It's from uh, the 2018 report. They're coming out with another one. I think it's been delayed a year or so. It's probably gonna come out next year. But as you can see in the US, compared to the average for the last, um, for the first half of the 1900s, most of the US is experiencing significantly warmer annual temperatures. So that's not surprising uh, to all of you. But let's take it down a step further into uh, here in Connecticut. And here in Connecticut, this is data I pulled from uh, NOAA, the National Oceans and Atmospheres, Atmospheric uh, um, Administration, um, which is great. You can do this for um, most of the large cities uh, in Connecticut. You can see the trend um, uh, that's pretty clear. We've gone up about three degrees Fahrenheit over the last 70 years. And you also can notice in the data that since the 70s, that rate of change is actually accelerating. So the rise in the average annual temperature translates to a bunch more days over 90 degrees, which then causes heat stress, impacts on human health and the environment. So why should we care about um, hot days, 90 degree days and heat stress. Who does it impact the most? Well, the science tells us that it mostly impacts the elderly, the young, the infirm, and it tends to impact distressed communities and marginalized communities who may not have the resources to adapt. Air conditioning being one of them, um, which in a lot of our older um, uh, and less affluent urban areas, air conditioning is actually a luxury. So those types of extreme heat events are happening more often here in Connecticut and something for us to worry about. Globally, the sea levels are rising and they've risen about eight or nine inches since 1880. This is a graph sort of showing where we are, are headed on a global sea level rise. It's also, again, something that's been accelerating in the second half uh, of the 20th century through today. So in many locations in the US, high tide flooding is now 300% to 900% more frequent than it was 50 years ago. So just a simple, you know, the, the two sort of major lunar high tides are more likely to cause flooding, flooding now than ever before. Again, let's take this down to Connecticut. Um, we have pretty good records back to uh, 1938 which I always quiz my Yale students of what uh, is the significance of 1938 in Connecticut. And very few of them know of the hurricane of 38, which is where a lot of our uh, original records come from and the sort of benchmark for the worst possible um, hurricane event, of, of a class three hurricane that hit us in 38. Um, so here in Connecticut, our sea levels are actually rising faster than the global average and they've gone up over 10 inches since 1938. Now is 10 inches a lot? Well, it depends on your perspective. Um, up in Litchfield Hills, you have a pretty long distance view of Long Island Sound. Um, but if you live next to a coastal marsh, you're concerned. If you're a coastal town and you're now seeing those monthly sort of full moon high tide and new moon high tides, basically flooding your roads uh, along the shoreline every month, undermining them, causing damage, causing you to invest resources, you're worried. If you're a utility company like United Illuminating, which is mine here in uh, the suburbs of New Haven, um, they have a lot of their substations right along the coast, including in Bridgeport. 10 inches uh, matters when you're worried about um, salt water mixing with your electrical equipment. Short answer, they don't mix very well at all. That was actually, I'll talk about a concern in our um, uh, storms of 2011 and 2012. Um, but what about the salt marsh sparrow? Um, yeah, they're concerned um, and they should be. The salt marsh sparrow, as many of you, you probably know better than I do, frankly, on this call. Um, they make their nest near the highest part of the marsh, inland when the marsh turns into ocean. But because the grasses are low, they have this tricky balance that they wanna find a good spot for the nest that's above the water, but not sticking too far up to avoid predators. So they have to find that sort of nice balance. And unfortunately with sea level rise and the increasing sort of high tide flood stages, more and more birds nests like this one in the picture, unfortunately are getting flooded. Eggs are floating away. It used to be the salt marsh sparrow could kind of factor in that that would happen some, but it's now happening more regularly and more systematically um, as they're, uh, um, now at much higher risk due to rising sea levels. 
So that's one of the things that in Connecticut we were concerned about, um, particularly in our coastal areas. And we actually assigned uh, a project for the Connecticut Institute for Resilience and Climate Adaptation at UConn to really figure out how much sea level rise Connecticut is supposed to, or is, is likely to experience. Um, there are plenty of global climate models, but we wanted to actually know, okay, for planning purposes, what should we be prepared for? And we had um, the scientists at UConn come up with a, a number and the punchline, according to that localized science, looking at our Long Island Sound um, experience, is that we should plan for up to 20 inches or 50 centimeters of sea level rise by 2050. A pause there, that's an additional 20 inches from now until 2050. And that's considerable when you're thinking about building infrastructure or these marsh uh, lands and what they're gonna be facing uh, over the next um, 30 years or so. So again, globally, the Intergovernmental Panel Report is tracking global sea surface uh, temperature rise. The oceans are getting warmer. What we care about here in Connecticut is that our local warm waters are also getting warmer. And we actually, um, my former agency, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection has been on Long Island Sound doing surveys um, for the last, I think 30 or 40 years, um, sampling monthly and they including sampling of temperature and they've tracked um, changes in the temperature of the bottom waters of Long Island, that in the spring, the bottom water is about three degrees Celsius warmer, and in summer, about two degrees warmer. So this is of concern if you live in Long Island Sound, and what we're seeing uh, in those same surveys is that the cold water species, which I believe is the light blue line at the top, are declining over time. So that's things like um, uh, winter flounder, uh, lobster, that's another one that's basically sort of crashed in, in the sound, et cetera. At the same time, the black line is on the way up and those are our warm water fish like sea bass and summer flounder and striped bass, spider crabs, all have been moving in. Now, if you're a fisherman, you may not be so upset about that because there's new things to go catch. But the if you're a local native species and you can't move, you can't, you know, your ecosystem and your food web is being disrupted by these new entrants and the things that you normally eat or care about, including the shorebirds and the migratory birds that are um, active in Long Island Sound. This is a potential to disrupt uh, the normal patterns uh, of the ecosystem uh, that are happening uh, in the sound. Um, last one to, I think last one to, to highlight is that we're getting, uh, depending on where you're living, either wetter or drier. Um, in general, the Northeast is getting wetter. Um, that's our precipitation pattern. And locally, yeah, if we look at Hartford again, over the last 70 years, each decade, over the last 70 years, we've been getting one more inch of rain per year. So a slow but steady increase over these 70 years to a new normal of how much rain we're getting. The problem is, and you can kind of get a sense of it from this graph, that we are in feast or famine mode. We get a whole lot of rain all at once and then we're in drought for a few months. That's a challenge for infrastructure. Um, it's hard to build systems that can handle four inches in an afternoon of, of rain, our culverts, our, uh, our uh, roadways, et cetera. But it's also challenging for uh, the ecosystems that get those huge flushes of water um, in short amounts of time. And um, that translates to local flooding problems. Um, in for those who, who take my Yale classes, I'm a fan of uh, political cartoons, other cartoons. I should have mentioned at the beginning, I've already given my slides over to uh, the folks, um, and I think they'll be posted on the website um, for later. So if things are moving quickly, all of the things have hyperlinks in the slides, and you can do deeper dives as you, as you wish. Um, so local flooding, and we saw that quite a bit in the storms of 2011 and 2012, and Connecticut has this interesting challenge. Challenge. Yes, we're having challenges from sea level rise and storm surge coming up our rivers, but our, our trend is to have larger wetter nor'easter events, meaning more rainfall coming down our rivers. And there's this new zone of vulnerability that's just a little off 
the shoreline where the rain waters coming down the rivers meet the um, storm surge coming up the rivers to a new zone of flooding risk. And um, a little note of caution, my uh, colleagues at the department um, told me that assume anywhere there are floodwaters, there is sewage because we put all our sewage treatment plants at the lowest lying area. They tend to get flooded during big flood events and the sewage mix with the, mixes with the water. So beware uh, of that. But the scientists are also mapping out where are we gonna be most vulnerable in the future due to sea level rise, storm surge and rain events. And uh, colleagues at the Nature Conservancy have interactive maps that can kind of show you uh, those challenges. I love telling my Yale students, um, having them point out where Ikea is and where the um, Tweed New Haven Airport is, all of which are largely underwater, um, including large parts of the, uh, um, the area around New Haven. You can do this uh, mapping exercise all along the shoreline. But um, our friends here at, at Audubon, Connecticut are actually trying to solve some of these problems. And I want to highlight a really cool project that Audubon, Connecticut has partnered with my former agency, um, Connecticut Deep with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and others for a $4 million um, restoration project at the Great Meadows Salt Marsh um, right on the Stratford Bridgeport line near Sikorsky Airport. Um, and this is a picture, I've, I've been out there to see the construction activities where they're um, doing a lot of work on, you know, to re- uh, invigorate the marsh, improve its sort of water flow and connection, um, get rid of invasive species like Phragmites, get rid of a lot of trash, unfortunately, that's been dumped into the marsh. But the coolest thing is that they're testing a new strategy to create nesting habitat for the salt marsh sparrow by creating some high marsh, creating little mounds or what they're calling sort of hummocks to kind of artificially create a safe zone, hopefully, for the salt marsh sparrow um, that would be resilient to floodwaters coming in and give a place uh, for the birds to nest in. So I'm excited to see that um, developing uh, as well. Um, but I want to focus in on, I include this picture because in grad school, um, this is East Haven, Cozy Beach. I lived not in this house that fell down, but I lived just a block or so away um, and sort of close this part of my talk with the recognition that um, we're now seeing this more often. We are now all experiencing climate change at kind of a personal level. Um, the year 2020 saw 22 weather and climate disasters with losses exceeding a billion dollars and similar numbers for 2021. So we're seeing the damage. It's on the newspaper. It's in our uh, social media feeds. It's um, above the fold, as the, they used to say. And it's showing up in those dramatic ways with the Texas near failure of their grid or California, the wildfires. But it's also happening at the more local level where you're noticing your backyard garden is uh, happening at different uh, times. It's uh, a recognition that um, flooding uh, events. And it's translated, and I have uh, wonderful colleagues at the Yale program on climate communication. I do highly recommend exploring their reports who've been surveying people and getting their attitudes on climate change now um, for uh, well over a decade. And the trend here is positive in the way, in sort of, I mean, it's positive that um, we're now seeing that more than half the country are concerned or alarmed by climate change. I say that as a positive in that people are recognizing the problem. Uh, we're gonna talk about solutions hopefully uh, in, in a few moments, but that's, and the number that are dismissive or doubtful is shrinking over time. So there's something breaking through uh, and I think has been breaking through more often uh, now than just 10 years ago um, or 20 years ago when I was in graduate school. Um, one of the challenges is that um, it would have been great if we were doing meaningful climate action 20 years ago. We're now unfortunately going to have uh, to do a whole lot more, a whole lot faster uh, if we hope to keep a manageable uh, hold on uh, the amount of heat that's already baked into our climate system. And my next part of my talk, I wanna sort of pose a question for you, um, whether you think the federal government is up to the task here to address the climate crisis. You don't have to answer me right away. We can save that for the Q&A. I have my 
um, views. And, and in essence, I asked the question, does the US have a coherent federal climate and or clean energy policy? Um, we've had 130 years of the federal government being involved in things that have impact on the climate and being involved in energy uh, policy from the industrial revolution where we were encouraging uh, exploration and, uh, uh, and exploitation of resources through the New Deal when we were making huge hydro dams out west um, investing in uh, large-scale hydropower, the atomic age, where the government was supporting um, peaceful use of uh, nuclear energy through energy policy, through the 70s, which most people like to forget about, and the oil shocks and oil crises in the 70s, into the um, Bush one and Bush two had energy policy acts, right through President Obama's stimulus act, which had a lot of uh, innovative investments in clean energy and really actually launched um, our modern sort of grid scale, large scale um, clean energy uh, industry. So the federal government has these policy tools. They can encourage uh, research and development. They can invest in infrastructure. They can provide things, subsidies or tax breaks, or they can tax things that if you don't like them. Um, but in many ways, federal government's policies have in many ways canceled each other out. There's always been some sort of, you know, if you're adding some uh, subsidy for the clean energy, you have to subsidize coal or you have to subsidize um, fossil fuels. So I worry that the federal government is sort of stuck uh, in, uh, in a bit. And I, I see in the chat um, that someone is uh, worried about uh, not having enough or that they, they need more apolitical folks on their payroll, which is a great segue from Suzanne to my next slide, which I think that the climate policy at the state or local level um, is where most of the action has been. And they've, they're have they not in the sort of more toxic political environment of Washington. Um, they have functioning, <laughs> they're still mostly functioning institutions. Um, and I would also argue that Below those sort of state governments, there are also functioning institutions like at city levels uh, within companies, within institutions like Yale or hospital systems, et cetera, that are actually doing some innovative um, clean energy and climate policy. They are, they tend not to be as hyperpartisan. I'm not going to be Pollyannish here. I know that there are plenty of politics everywhere, but it seems that many states aren't necessarily at the sort of level of, of hyperpartisanism, partis partisanism, partisanship, whichever. It's you're getting me like after five o'clock. I can't possibly get all my words out correctly after a long day, uh, so I apologize for that. Um, they're also a force to be reckoned with if you think about the coalition of states and cities and companies that have stepped up and said, yeah, we want to be part of the climate solutions. They actually add up representing the US about 70% of the US uh, GDP, almost two thirds of our population and about half of our greenhouse gas emissions. So that's adding up all the states who are committed, the cities, the companies, the institutions like the colleges and universities. So. That's not a small number if you can get them all moving in the right uh, direction. And what I argue is, and I, I talk about quite a bit with my students, is that they've, um, I, I always show a picture of this and give a quote from one of my favorite uh, Supreme Court cases, because I am a lawyer as well. It was from Justice Brandeis in the early 30s during the original New Deal, um, a new state ice company versus Liebman, where Justice Brandeis described how a state, if they choose, serve as a laboratory to, and try novel social and economic experiments without risk to the rest of the country. And this is the case that's the origin of the phrase the, that uh, the states are the laboratories of democracy, where you can experiment and try uh, innovative policies and approaches. I love this picture as well um, because it's the photo of the last coal-fired power plant in Massachusetts being blown up. And in its place, they're gonna have a hub for offshore wind. So the new offshore wind farms are gonna be bringing um, clean energy to the New England grid. We can talk about that in the Q&A, the sort of challenges of uh, offshore wind um, to uh, those who care about uh, birds and uh, ecosystem health as well. So, what have they done? They, the states and cities have done a few things. Um, I just want to give a quick overview, but then make sure we save plenty of time for Q&A in the end. So I 
kind of put them into three buckets. They, they've created targets, they've innovated, and they've been mobilizing capital and private capital um, largely. So the dollars needed to make this transformation happen. So on the targets front, um, there's been changes to the sort of rules and mandates at the state level. Two, I want to highlight um, the first, um, public utility commissions. These are the state bodies, regulatory bodies that oversee the decisions made by all the electric companies uh, around the country. They are key players in this transition to clean energy. And some states like Colorado and Massachusetts and Maine have said to those utility commissions, when you're doing your work, we want to change the definition of what's in the public interest, which used to just be make sure the power is affordable and safe and reliable. They've now added, and the power that you are regulating and choosing is advancing the climate goals and potentially invest, addressing environmental justice or energy equity issues. So imagine if your utility regulator, instead of just trying to make sure you get the cheapest power, was also trying to make sure that we're getting the cleanest power. That's a paradigm shift from for an agency like the utility regulators that don't usually think about clean energy or they're struggling to sort of figure out where what they are supposed to do in the world of clean energy. The other thing I want to highlight is that many states, and I think we're up to 30 states in the District of Columbia, have decided by state statute to say to their utility companies, you have to buy a certain percentage of your electricity from clean energy sources. And that's called either a renewable, renewable portfolio standard or a clean energy standard. And it's a mandate. It says you got to do it so that every plug in the state has an increasing percentage of clean energy, oftentimes now with a target of completely clean energy by a date certain 2035, 2045, 2050. So again, states have the power to tell their utilities what they want. We want clean energy. You go out and find it. You go out and, and, and buy it um, and uh, figure that uh, out on your own. So that's one sort of tool that states are using. Another place that they're innovating, um, uh, they're doing is that they're creating new innovative structures. And a lot of that's happening actually around this sort of new world of the grid. Um, the old grid, which still exists, um, hadn't changed much since the 1880s when Thomas Edison first made the first grid in uh, lower Manhattan. It was built on a theory that a large power plant would send power on transmissions lines, long distances, and eventually get to your house. Nowadays, your house, including mine, is generating power and sending it back to the grid. Or your car might have a battery and it might come home and then charge itself on your grid. And or if it has extra charge, might give that grid to that charge to the grid. Or like the picture here uh, is an innovation that Vermont did where they decided that it would be great to have a series of Tesla Powerwall batteries distributed around Vermont that would turn into a virtual power plant on the hazy, hot, and humid days that would be powered by, they tend to be paired with um, home solar arrays, powered by the sun, sitting there waiting for a, you know, a hazy, hot, and humid July you know, 25th, where they would turn on that network of 2,000 batteries instead of turning on the dirtiest, most expensive, oldest um, fossil fuel generator. So this is called you know, addressing the sort of peak load. So that hazy, hot and humid day, everyone has their air conditioning on, the grid is stressed. If you had a, low, a fleet of batteries, I can say, we'll relieve that stress. It actually saves money by avoiding the expensive and dirty power from being turned on. And the Vermont Green Mountain Power convinced the Vermont utility regulator that this would actually save them money. And lo and behold, in the first year of their program, on one of those days, they saved $500,000 on one day alone. And another day, they saved a million dollars. So they were right away sort of realizing, holy cow, by just using these batteries and avoiding expensive grid power, it's a program that more than pays for itself. And that's the type of innovation uh, that we need uh, more of, which actually has the utilities engaged in a positive way on uh, that new sort of very different and modernized grid.
The last thing I want to mention is the, the importance of, of, of uh, capital and um, financing and paying for this. I know there's going to be questions in the chat about how we pay for this on a global scale, but I want to first talk about um, here in the U.S. And one of the things we've seen um, is a new uh, role of green banks. So this is a um, quasi-governmental organization that's really designed to make uh, investment in clean energy less risky for the private capital markets by taking up some of that risk um, and using some um, state funds to leverage investment um, by you know five or seven times by the private sector. And that's the story of the Connecticut Green Bank and there's one in New York and in Maryland and there's now popping up all over is a recognition that sometimes these new technologies are risky or unproven. So the government can find a way to help get those technologies through that period where they're viewed as too risky by the private capital markets and uh, in doing so help sort of spawn a clean energy industry. The other thing we're seeing is that large corporate players, this one is a, a Microsoft announcement, but Google and Apple and Walmart and others are active purchasers. They are, they are again institutions that are setting climate goals and actively purchasing clean energy, which again can change the outlook and attitudes in large parts of the country, frankly, if you have this large company, a large employer demanding I'm going to only build my data center in your community if you can guarantee me that I have clean energy for it. It's sort of flipping the script on, on how things uh, normally happen. The last thing I want to mention before we get to Q&A is the importance of um, recognizing equity and, and inclusion in the clean energy revolution. And that's something that we saw here in Connecticut early on in our Connecticut Green Bank that their residential solar program, a lot of the early days of the incentives were going to our wealthier communities, the Westports, West Hartford's and Woodbridge, which is uh, where I live and not the Waterberries or Bridgeports. So, um, and they actually were tracking that in the sort of 2012 time period, 80% of their residential solar projects were happening in communities that were above the average area median income. And only 20% were going to less wealthy communities, poorer communities, or distressed communities. They decided to solve the problem with a little creative sort of investment. So they decided two things. One, they would give three times the incentive if you're going to go solar in a distressed and lower moderate income community. So you can get more dollars invested in the places that were being left behind. And then the second thing is that they partnered with a for-profit company called Posigen um, to create creative financing tools. So again, one of the challenges of solar in the low and moderate income space is um, credit rating, as which is what banks all you know sort of go by on you know how to understand if a uh, investment is uh, or a, a lease uh, in that case is risky. And this company had a different underwriting uh, system that was based more on your history of your bill payments, other sorts of factors. And um, the Green Bank was willing to loan money to Posigen at a um, relatively low rate compared to what the private capital markets were to let them do more of this investing in what would otherwise be considered a risky um, investment. Turns out that um, less than 2% or 1% actually of the projects they invested in actually defaulted on their loans. So they had to, they, they proved out that model and fast forward six years. Now half of our projects, residential solar projects in Connecticut go to uh, areas um, that are wealthy and half are going to areas that are distressed. So um, I want to, looking at the time, I want to, I'll pass for now but I'm happy to come back and talk about what's happening at the US level. And I wanna just get to the end of the things that we can all do together. Cause I think um, we've, I've given you just a, a real small slice of the innovation that's happening in, in policy at the state and local level. And what we're seeing again from the Yale program on climate communication is across the country, there's actually a recognition that, yeah, we need to do something about climate change, even at the federal, you know, across, this is a map showing that 75% well, of uh, adults, including, you know, all across the country, frankly, are support regulating carbon dioxide as a pollutant. So how do we get from a broad general support into actual sort of action. And there, um, 
I have five ideas um, for all of us to, to think about and um, have a talk about um, as soon as I'm done. First, I'd love for all of you to evaluate your personal options to uh, help reduce your carbon emissions. Can you go solar? Um, what about battery storage? Can you electrify your home heating and cooling? Something I'm just trying to do this spring to get off or at least partially auto off of oil, buying an electric vehicle, looking at your investment portfolio and aligning it um, with uh, clean energy and away from fossil fuels. This is step one, which is a good step, but I don't want folks to fall into the trap of thinking that this whole problem's on all of your shoulders. It's not. There are some institutional challenges here um, that the fossil fuel industry has frankly been trying to take the blame off of them and put it on all of us. Um, so I don't want us to fall in that trap, but I do want folks can actually take a look at their own sort of personal options. The second thing I'd love for people to think about is evaluating your networks. Where do you work? Where do you go to school? Are you active in your town, your church, your synagogue? Are they thinking about um, clean energy options? Is that institution thinking about uh, having a sustainability committee or a green committee or a, a green team. Um, can you join that or create it if it isn't there already? Always better to think about this is a big problem, always better to work together at teams and slightly above uh, just the individual household. Um, third, you got to let elected leaders know your views on the topic and that you're passionate about it and that you vote. Um, that's always, and that's important at all levels, the local, state, uh, and federal level. Individually, as part of a campaign, someone needs to balance the millions and millions of dollars that the oil companies are spending on lobbying, and all of us uh, can do that collectively. Um, fourth, figure out your superpower. Uh, and I've taken that um, from a, a book called All We Can Save, um, which is a, a, a great sort of series of essays on, uh, on uh, confronting the climate crisis, um, women-centered um, book as well. Um, what is your superpower and how can you use it to address the climate crisis? So for this, I mean, some of you are artists, some of you are writers or communications professionals or financial advisors or whatever you are. The transformation that we need is broad and deep and we'll need basically everyone at all levels engaged. So figuring out what you're passionate about in your life and how it might be of use to folks trying to make a difference on the climate crisis. And the fifth and final thing is something you're already doing tonight. Um, you are talking about and engaging with um, global warming and the climate crisis. And this is something I get uh, from Catherine Hayhoe, who's a climate scientist at Texas Tech. She's part of the Intergovernmental Panel of, on Climate Change. But she often highlights the importance of just having the conversation. And it's important as well um, in the, uh, the Yale Program on Climate Communication has found that people who routinely talk about the climate crisis are actually more likely to do something about it or are, you know, to recognize that it is a challenge. That if you're hearing about it from friends and neighbors, if you're having that conversation, there are plenty of resources. Catherine Hayo actually has quite a few of them on how to have the tough conversations, the difficult ones um, with family or friends if they're challenging. But even if they're not challenging, just making sure it's part of that general conversation uh, that we're all having. So I wanna stop talking and hear from you, but I'll do the quick summary of the things that we went over. Um, it's serious, the climate crisis. It's hitting close to home. It's impacting vulnerable groups and it's impacting sensitive ecosystems and frankly, birds that we care about. Um, states and local entities, cities, we didn't talk as much about cities, but I'm happy to, are doing a lot of really cool innovative things that should be emulated at the federal level. And we are the ones that can help make that happen collectively if we start taking some steps together. So that's uh, my presentation um, for tonight. And I'm happy to pause there and open up for questions um, from this great audience. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I have the question, sir. Huh? Sure. Hi. Yes. Hi. My name is Eric. And you were talking about the clean power and big, you know, the savings. I know what you're talking about, what you mean about the savings. I just get the, my electric bill and electric go from the last year more, the, more than three cents 
or the kilowatts. So actually, we do not save. I pay like the over the $60 more what I pay in the same thing in the last year, okay? Yeah. So we have the more this clear power, but we do not save the money. Actually, I do not save the money, okay? And yeah. I'm not only one who lives in Connecticut, and I believe that everyone got the highest bill. So, you know, the wind power, whatever other power, do, do nothing for the customers, correct? Uh, no, it's a, it's a great question, and it is a challenge of our clean energy deployment that it does, um, right now, it is more expensive, um, particularly in New England, than grid power. So the power that we'd be getting from the ISO New England um, was about four cents, you know, three to four cents. Um, mm -hmm. Current sort of grid scale solar in Connecticut is about four and a half cents, so a little bit more. Offshore wind is definitely more expensive. It's coming in long-term contracts uh, around seven to eight cents. So yes, we are paying a premium. Flip side is that um, all those other resources that we're getting from the grid, they're not paying for all the externalities, the problems that they're causing, the sea level rise, the pollution that they're... So we have a system that doesn't fully value the benefits of the clean energy that doesn't show up in your bills, nor does the cost associated with the fossil energy show up other than our increased trips to the hospital, um, increased days with asthma, lost days at work due to health impacts, et cetera. But at your local, at your personal bill level, that's challenging because you feel, you see only that uh, the cost of energy goes up. Now, efficiency helps. So your investment in efficiency at your own home reduces the amount of energy that you're using. And, or if you can go solar at your own house, that can be a way to save money um, at your sort of personal bill level, but you're right. One of the um, the the challenges of uh, this transition, particularly for the Northeast. Now, other parts of the country, grid scale solar, grid scale wind, is coming in at like one or two cents per kilowatt hour, which is way cheaper than fossil resources. That's where it's abundant in the Southeast and the Southwest. There, they have structural problems of making sure all that energy can be used and utilized and that gets into complicated sort of grid things. But at your personal level, that's the ability to invest in efficiency. There are programs in Connecticut um, that will, can help get you in um, improved sort of efficiency of your lighting, improved um, uh, in your uh, um, insulation, et cetera. But again, it's where are we investing uh, at that personal level versus uh, the challenges of the grid level. Hopefully that helped uh, sort of answer. Yes, whatever I will do, you know, the power company will charge me more than they charge the last year anyway. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, yeah, no, there is always the feeling that the power company keeps prices yeah. keep going up. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for this one. Um, I have the, another question. We're talking about the climate change, you know, uh, for the last good few years. I'm just worried. Is we talking about the climate change on this planet because, because of the humans? Or if we only be the humans on our planet, we won't be the uh, climate change? For example, like in the Mars, it's no human. It's no climate change over there. Yeah, so that was goes back to one of my earlier slides that, um, um, and I wouldn't, let's not go to Mars because that's not where <laughs> I'm uh, expertise, but the, the human uh, elements, the burning of fossil fuels, the additional carbon dioxide, methane, other greenhouse gases mm -hmm. in the atmosphere is a, um, is the only sort of explanation of why we are seeing the warming that we're seeing. The earth has natural variation in the atmosphere from volcanoes. We have a slightly wobbly orbit around the sun. So there are those natural cycles that have happened over millions and millions of years. Correct. What we're seeing now is different. It is the human activity. Mars actually used to have an atmosphere, but then didn't. And Venus is runaway greenhouse gas. So I don't want to get into planets, although I was a geology mm -hmm. major under, undergrad. But the science is, is crystal clear now that it is the human addition of greenhouse gases that is responsible for the warming that we're seeing now. 
Let well, me get someone else's. Uh, I know there's been some questions in the chat. Um, so let me see if I can catch up to them. Um, so I had seen Thomas uh, Zizou is uh, hearing that limiting the increase in global temps to one and a half degrees will not be enough. And do I agree? So it's a great question. And the one and a half degree report, which came out in 2018, didn't say that there will be no effects from um, uh, one and a half degrees of warming. It actually still will have significant harm to coral reefs. It'll have the types of severe storms that we're currently experiencing. It's just saying that at that level, we're probably not seeing some low-lying and you know, Pacific sort of countries being lost. We're, we're not seeing, we're, we're not likely to get into the tipping points on the Greenland or Antarctic ice sheets. We're not likely to see the, uh, we're not as likely to see the, um, the Gulf Stream and its salinity profile get disrupted to a level that's, you know, dangerous. That, that number was a, yeah, it's not going to be great because what we're currently living through that's climate induced is not great, but it's not, we're, in a zone that's less likely to be catastrophic. So, um, but science is constantly evolving on that question. And if you are um, reliant on coastal, uh, on coral reefs, or you are a, uh, a creature in those coral reefs, you may not like the current, you know, being sacrificed, but there, and that's what the, a lot of the scientific rep reports are these sort of shades of, um, you know, risk of yellow, oranges, and reds. And at one and a half degrees warming, the risk is mitigated uh, enough. Um, Suzanne, you had a couple of, and, and feel free people can raise their hands or just unmute themselves if you want to jump in as, as well. Suzanne, you had a couple of questions. Um, one was how uh, developing countries can obtain resources to assist in advancing climate goals. That's a great question. It's been part of the global conference of the parties discussions are a, a lot of the sticking point is who's going to, you know, who can give, you know, which of the developed countries are going to give resources or help invest in resiliency, adaptation, or carbon, you know, sequestration or mitigation projects in developing countries. And that's always going to be a, a hard question of who's willing to put up uh, the dollars in that sort of direct transfer of money from countries from developed to less developed countries. What we're seeing, though, is the innovations that are happening in the US and in Europe and in China and elsewhere on the technology side have a habit of leapfrogging. Um, uh, you don't have to follow the same dirty uh, development path if you could develop a battery storage and solar tied um, energy system for places that don't have any energy right now or are relying on um, basically burning wood for, for energy. So we saw that in the telecommunications world that no one decided let's string a bunch of telephone wires today. Um, they instead said, well, if you don't have phone service, let's jump right to to cell phone service. And oh, this house also happens to be a relatively cheap computer and you know, access to information and communication. So there's some hope that you can avoid the sort of bad, dirty middle and sort of jump ahead. Um, and that might be possible as these technologies get cheaper and, and more widely available. Um, I, have a, I have a question. Sure, um, hop in. Yeah, uh, my, my name is David Woolley. I'm Jeannie's husband, Hi, and David. we we have a we have a solar domestic hot water system, and we also have a solar PV system on our house, and uh, so we're big proponents of solar. And I also work for an engineering company. In fact, we're 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 right now engaged in a project at Yale Divinity School um, with some new dorms, are supposedly a net zero energy. With with solar and and storage to get through the, um, let's say, uh, 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 you know, several several nights, and, and that's that's really my question regarding solar, and not just not just in in that instance where, um, you know, battery storage is now sort of a big thing for for storing energy for solar or wind, and uh, that works well for an overnight situation, maybe a couple of nights where 
where your solar gain is, is, is not that great. But I, I, I'm a lot more concerned with, let's say, long-term storage. And, um, uh, you know, as an example, the, the example you made before with the hot summer day, well, our system is great for the hot summer day. I mean, we, we export a lot of power to the grid. Um, but in, in the winter time, we import power from the grid. And uh, if we could, well, right now we, you know, the grid is our storage source, um, but that can't go on forever. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I mean, I'm thinking that maybe hydrogen um, and then um, hydrogen generated some sort of green method, electrolysis is a possibility, but that may be too energy inefficient. Um, are you aware of any any new systems uh, that that are, let's say, either coming online or possibly being looked at to, uh, to generate hydrogen for storage? So it's it's a great question, and I wish I had an answer for you today, but I have in my. Um, uh, my graduate uh, capstone class, I have a team of students who are actually investigating that question right now. So come well, back to me okay. in like May and I may have a better answer, okay. <laughs> but, but you're right. But, but what you're highlighting is something that we all need to be worried about in this new electrified future where the, the best way to sort of decarbonize in this next 10 years is to shift as much as we can over to the electric grid and make the electric grid as clean as possible. And the shifting as much as we can is your car and home heating and cooling and pairing that with their solar on your rooftop or grid scale solar means that all of it is running on something that's much cleaner, less uh, greenhouse gases than the fossil fuels being burned. Now, the problem is you're then reliant on your car being charged and your house being heated. And if the grid is not resilient and not stable enough to actually be up when you need it, or if you don't have sufficient um, battery deployment, um, you're in trouble. You're creating new sort of areas of vulnerability. Now, a lot of people are also, when you're out of electricity, my oil furnace won't run either, you know, uh, during those outages. Yeah, right. And in the battery story, there's a new program in Connecticut launching this year to try to do what, like what Vermont did and get a whole lot more of household scale batteries deployed. And they will do a few things. They will do the same thing that Vermont does with the getting at that sort of peak load problem. But if there's an incoming storm, and for most of our major you know, storm events, we know that they're coming our way. The utility company won't take control of your battery. They won't drain it. They will leave your battery there for your own uh, resilience. But you're right, it only gets you a day or two. Um, and you might stretch it a little if the soul, if the sun is shining post storm. So hydrogen is one of those things that has been out there as, you know, is it going to save the day? And um, green hydrogen in particular, particularly if you have the ability to create it at times when there isn't as much load um, at times when the grid would love to offload some uh, extra load. And we're seeing that in, in California in particular, where the midday, they have so much solar deployed now in California, in the middle of the day, they're over-generating power and they actually have to, have to turn off some of their solar rays. If there was a hydrogen generator that is paired to that grid surplus is getting really cheap power at those times. Yeah, you can start seeing those systems that are smart enough to say, hey, I'll take the load when you don't need it. Our version here in New England is that nuclear runs 24 seven all the time. In the middle of the night, that might be when you make your hydrogen because the nuclear needs to put its load onto the grid. They can't nuclear power plants do not turn off and on <laughs> quickly or easily, or uh, they just sort of stay put. But you've sort of highlighted this sort of period of time where we're going to need to figure out storage uh, in a big way, both uh, big ways and small ways, both at your household scale and at the grid or system scale in order to keep steady power. Then we have to worry about the resiliency of our system to storms and other events, which are going to get more common in climate change as well. But it's a great question. Thank you. Other questions? I have one more question. Sure, uh, go ahead. Yes, just we're talking about the solar system. 
in the solar system is only on the house, households. Why the big company, they do not use the solar system? Oh, they do. Um, yeah, no, so mm -hmm. in Connecticut, the, um, we have what's called the residential solar program and we've deployed yes. um, 300 or so megawatts there and we've deployed um, behind the meter another three to 400 megawatts at schools at um, here in New Haven, the IKEA, the um, over at Yale has a two megawatt away, rooftops, other sorts of things, municipal buildings, landfills. Then we have a whole nother sort of set of solar arrays that are at the grid scale above two megawatts. So we're roughly, you know, 300 megawatts residential solar, 300 megawatts commercial solar, and another 400 plus or minus megawatts of solar at the grid scale. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, I do a lot of work with towns that are trying to, schools mm -hmm. are a wonderful place to deploy solar because they have big yeah. flat roofs and um, they periodically re place their roof. So we've, I've been working with towns to keep in mind when they put a new roof on the school, hey, that's the right time to put a, a solar array on because you have 20 years of generation. There's even a policy in Connecticut that lets you, if you're a municipality and you put solar on the roof of your school, it sometimes generates more power than the school needs. It can actually virtually net meter or virtually get credits at the fire department and at the library and at town hall. So you can make a larger array on that lovely flat roof of the school and then virtually you take credit for all the extra solar in your other sort of uh, buildings around town. It's a special benefit for uh, municipalities. Other questions? Um, I know Suzanne, Suzanne, if you want to unmute and ask, you had a few that were in the chat. Because um, I, Suzanne, did you want to hop in and? Yeah, this is actually, uh, my name is Ed. Uh, I was using, I'm using my wife's computer. Oh. <laughs> Apology. Not, Apologies, Ed. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, you think solar is enough, uh, will be enough, or do you think we should explore nuclear again? energy or is that just going backwards? Oh, Ed, that, I'm literally uh, talking about that with my undergrad class on Wednesday, that debate over nuclear power. Um, and it's controversial and um, in a lot of ways. I think, um, so a couple of, of things. Nuclear has is zero carbon base load, large scale energy that is on uh, uh, for you know huge amounts of time, doesn't have the problems of you know, when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing. So as a sort of base load technology, it's great. Here in Connecticut, we were faced with the, um, we have a 2000 megawatt nuclear power plant down in Waterford, Connecticut. It's the largest power plant in all of New England. And we were faced with a question of, of trying, of they were threatening to leave, they were threatening to shut down. Um, and did we want to subsidize existing nuclear to stay on the system? And that was, uh, we answered that question, yes, here in Connecticut, so did New York, so did Illinois. There's been a few states that have been saying, let's keep our existing nuclear fleet for at least a bridge uh, until we get more wind and battery storage and the other renewables uh, up to speed. Um, controversial because it is the waste problem and or um, it is a challenging thing to run. I alluded to it a, a bit, um, but that 2000 megawatt um, power plant in Waterford needs 15 to 1700 people to run it. And a lot of those, some percentage of those folks are people to guard it and to make sure that it's safe and secure natural gas plants of a similar size might have less than 100 people working at a plant. So it is a much more expensive operation. If a nuclear plant has to stop operating um, quickly, which happens on occasion, it happened once when I was commissioner, the, in essence, the equivalent of the um, substation right next to Millstone um, blew a fuse, a trip like in your basement when the fuse box goes, that's really, in a, a very different situation when a 2000 megawatt breaker, circuit breaker breaks off. They were then down for two months um, because they had to go back and make sure that everything that stopped in whatever position it stopped 
could be restarted safely and not have any concerns about what valves were open or closed. I mean, it was a major sort of challenge. Um, so, Do you think the dispute is because people look at it as high risk, high reward type of uh, situation? Yeah, no, and and you hear about the near accidents or the real accidents of Fukushima um, Three Mile Island, that gets seared in people's memory. And, and we are not always rational thinkers about risk um, and nuclear is viewed that way. Now, the other thing that was in your question as well is that there's always talk about the next generation of nuclear. Um, the thing that's coming right around the horizon, smaller scale, safer, more nimble with the different materials. It doesn't create waste. I've been hearing that for at least 20 years at every five years, it's only five years away. Um, so there's a little concern there. Now it's still in the federal funding packages of all you know, investing in new nuclear. The scary thing, or not scary, it's not a word I should use with nuclear, but the challenging thing with existing nuclear designs is that they've tried to build some lately, including down in uh, either South Carolina or um, I think it was South Carolina has one that's already, it was a $9 billion project that now is at $18 billion in cost. And we've sort of lost the ability to actually create these at a economic scale. So nuclear, um, I'm in the camp that says, let's keep what we got, but make sure we're investing in the things to replace it uh, over the next 10 years. That's a great question. Yes. I, I want to be respectful of time. I don't, I'm happy to take a few more questions, but I know that um, you all probably have lives and other things that you want to get back to. But this is, I, I love doing this with you all. I love doing it with my students and I'm happy to take a few more if there are questions. I, I just put something in the chat box, but it doesn't appear to have popped up. Oh, My it, name is Angela Dimmitt. This is kind of a silly question, but all this talk about eliminating lawns and replacing them with native plantings. I've wanted to put solar on my house, but it faces the wrong way. I've got quite a lot of open space, but it's a small area. What sense would it make to look into putting panels in my garden? So yeah, Angela, I think your message went directly to me, but not to the group, but I, um, it's, ah. a great, it's a great question. Um, I will share that um, I, my solar panels are ground mounted in my backyard and uh, it's because my wife was okay with me taking up part of our lawn for our solar panel because my <laughs> roof also faced the wrong way. It was shaded and it had, um, and we need a new roof. Again, when you're putting solar panels on your roof, it's better to have a, a, a new roof because it's a 20 year sort of investment in the solar array. So it, it is doable. It's a little more expensive. Um, it's because you have to dig a trench from your solar panels back to your house. So that adds cost. It also a little more steel and racking to get the solar. But um, all the solar installers will do it. Um, and um, so it's definitely a, a possibility um, to explore. You do need to find a good spot on your lawn that has uh, solar, um, um, a good southern facing exposure, and to have a willing sp spouse who's willing to uh, donate part of the lawn. My solar panels are right next to my garden, which is uh, uh, back in that part of our, our, our lawn. And the solar guys complain that I put the garden in the better, <laughs> the garden gets more sun than, <laughs> better sun than my solar panels. But I told them that was my tomatoes came first. So. Well, I guess if it works for you, it's worth looking into. Thank you very much. Sure. And I would be ripping up my vegetable garden. <laughs> <laughs> um, other questions? Well, if, we have, if we have no other uh, questions, maybe we'll just say thank you very much. This was very, very interesting uh, presentation. And yeah. So I, um, I really enjoyed it. It was great to, to spend some time with you all. You'll have the slides um, and on the slides are also my email address, which I'll, I'll put it in the, the chat as, as well. I'm happy to take follow-up questions.